Psychodrama's theory of change is spontaneity creativity theory. Uh, and we define spontaneity as this energy that occupies us, that allows us to feel a sense of freedom and vigor and focus, and that it allows us to have new responses to old reoccurring situations and adequate responses to novel situations that we're faced with. So you could think of spontaneity as this sense of life energy that gives us um, a competence for life, for facing life, life's problems and dilemmas, and finding creative solutions to them. Rhino has this whole map called the Canon of Creativity that outlines the relationship between spontaneity and creativity and really highlights the importance of the warming up process. So the Canon of Creativity is a circle with a line in the middle of it. And so the circle represents the warming up process that we start with all the cultural conserves all of the ideas and things that already exist. And we use these as a warming up process. And at some point in our warming up process, we tap into a spark of spontaneity. And when the spontaneity is accessed, it's met with creativity. That spontaneity and creativity are twin concepts that they, they gravitate towards each other. And that spontaneous energy with that creative force results in the creation of something new. A new belief about ourselves or about the world, a new theory, a new treatment approach, a new piece of art or music, a new policy in an organization, a new publication, a, a new idea, a new role within our lives, a new coping strategy, a new response to anger or sadness, a new way of being in the world. And as soon as something new is created, it becomes a part of the cultural conserve that's available to us. And we use that cultural conserve and all the others to warm up to new spontaneity and creativity. So this is the canon of creativity. It's a map for change. And you can think of it as a map for change on a intrapsychic level, on a interpersonal level in relationships, on an organizational level, and on a societal or communal level, that if we're going to try to cultivate change, we need to first engage in a warming up process and engage everybody that's involved in a warming up process. That if we want to uh, develop some sort of new policy in an organization, for example, the policy will be much easier accepted if we warm up the group, the organization, to that new change. We have discussions about the policy. We collaborate and fine-tune the policy. We get feedback about the policy. And in doing so, we're engaging in a warming up process. We start to highlight the importance of having a new policy. We outline a timeline for when the policy is going to be implemented and what it's going to uh how it's going to impact people. And then we implement that policy. We create the change. Versus if we were to create this policy behind closed doors without warming up the rest of the organization and the staff to the policy change, and then just send out an email and make an announcement that, hey, guess what? There's a new policy, and now you all have to follow it. There's going to be much more resistance, much less compliance with the policy, and it's going to be much more difficult to roll out that new policy. So this warming up process is a really important aspect of psychodrama philosophy, and it's something that I feel like gets overlooked quite often in other approaches. That we can't just engage in a psychodrama without engaging in a warming up process. We can't just dive into trauma therapy and trauma processing without first engaging in a warming up process. In psychodrama, we say there's no such thing as bad role plays or psychodramas. There's just poor warm ups to it. And we also say that there's no such thing as resistance. Instead, we reconceptualize resistance as either a lack of warm up or that somebody's just warmed up to something else. So uh, we really look at resistance through the lens of a warming up process or lack of a warming up process. 
So the warming up process is the operationalization of spontaneity. And from what I've seen clinically and in my research, what I'm noticing is that trauma survivors compared to others are going to need a longer warming up process, a more gradual warming up process, a gentler warming up process that we can't just dive right into the intensity of the work. There needs to be a more gradual warm up to that and a more gradual process of developing safety, really. Uh, my research is showing that there's an inverse relationship between PTSD and spontaneity, that when PTSD symptoms are high, spontaneity is low. And that when we increase our spontaneity or help our clients increase their spontaneity, their PTSD scores drop at a similar rate. And in 2022, I published uh, the first study on PTSD and spontaneity. It was a controlled um, research study on a three-day psychodrama group. And we found that the control group, their PTSD and spontaneity scores and their post-traumatic growth scores stayed pretty similar. Whereas the experiment group that participated in psychodrama groups, their PTSD scores dropped. And as their scores dropped, their spontaneity scores and their post-traumatic growth scores increased. Interestingly, in that study, we found that the scores uh, in the days after the workshop, although there were some changes, the changes were far more pronounced at our 30-day follow-up than they were in, just in the days after the workshop, suggesting that spontaneity and post-traumatic growth uh, might take some more time to cultivate and, and set in an intense psychodrama experience the individuals might need some time to process and digest the experience. Moreno theorized 100 years ago that spontaneity and anxiety would be inversely related. And now there's been multiple studies confirming this. And a whole bunch of different studies on spontaneity showing that it's inversely related to other mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, panic disorder, uh, PTSD now. I have a new study where we found it inversely related to traumatic grief as well. And there's also been a bunch of research on spontaneity showing that it's positively related to a whole bunch of measures of well-being and health. That as spontaneity increases, so too does overall well-being, happiness, and mental health. So in psychodrama, spontaneity is really the, the most important thing. Spontaneity is the curative factor in psychodrama. So through the lens of spontaneity theory, we could conceptualize PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, as being either a deficiency in spontaneity, that there's a rigidity and a stuckness, a lack of access to spontaneity in the aftermath of trauma, which leads to repetition, compulsions, reenactments, um, hyperarousal that prevents us from tapping into creativity and or that spontaneity or that PTSD is also characterized by a sense of pathological spontaneity. So pathological spontaneity is when we have novel responses, but that they're not adequate to the situation at hand. So you could think of pathological spontaneity as being uh, the opposite of rigidity or stuckness. It's essentially a sense of chaos, really. And many other uh, mental health experts are suggesting that chaos and rigidity, uh, a lack of containment and over-containment, are two ends of a spectrum that characterize all social problems, all mental health problems, and that health mental health, social health, physical health, exists in the balance between them. In spontaneity theory, we would say that, that healthy spontaneity exists in the balance between pathological spontaneity and a deficiency in spontaneity. So this is how we might think of and conceptualize PTSD through the lens of spontaneity theory. Through that lens, then, 
Our goal would be to help clients tap into their spontaneity, to engage in a warming up process that's gradual and meets them where they're at, so that they can access that autonomous healing center within, and in doing so, tap into their spontaneity, their creativity, and develop new ways of responding to their trauma, of renegotiating the way the trauma lives within them. To cultivate post-traumatic growth through a spontaneity state and through a creative response to the trauma, a new response. So at this point, I want to pause and offer some reflective questions. Uh, the first question here is, does my facilitation approach and the group structures I use provide enough emphasis on the warming up process? How do I warm myself up to lead a group or to lead a meeting? So before we engage in a warming up process uh, or try to warm up our clients or colleagues or group members, we first have to warm ourselves up as facilitators and as leaders. So in what ways can I promote a warming up process for myself? And what ways can I help my organization warm up before I'm implementing any major changes? 